Mario Sola, good morning. It's really nice to see everyone here this morning. And what a beautiful morning we uh, have again out there this morning. Uh, just a few announcements to make this morning. Um, wait for this thing to start up. As everyone is aware that uh, the government is pulling the emergency brakes on the province again. So with that, there will be uh, new regulations imposed. So effective tomorrow morning, um, the lockdown is on. So starting Easter Sunday, we will be under a new regulations which will restrict our current capacity by half. So the dining hall will be set up for chairs to serve as overflow. So if you have the ushers telling you that the sanctuary is full, we just ask you to please be courteous and follow their directions as they're just fulfilling their duties. And again, as always, the sermons will be posted later the day or early the next day. Um, really, those are the only announcements that I have right now. Um, there's a couple of prayer requests here. Uh, please pray for Helen Friesen, uh, Usher Henry Friesen's wife. She had surgery yesterday. There was some complications, but she messaged this morning saying that things are looking positive and things are better. So we just, again, just want to lift them up in your prayers for healing and comfort. Um, also pray for Henry Jansen. Uh, Henry lost his wife last year and is grieving. So if you if you think of them, and not just him, all of them, like there's been so many that have lost loved ones in this very difficult time. So just if anyone comes to mind, we just encourage you to lift them up. And if you are needing prayer support, you can reach out to any of us and we would be more than happy to pray for you guys. Um, also pray for the uh, um, pastor elected, myself, my wife and the family and Dave and Ann and his family. With that, today's reading that I've chosen is out of Isaiah 53, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. I asked Pastor Corny if he had a long message, because I was trying to pick out a few verses. I just couldn't come up with, with where to stop, so he said it was okay. So today I'm reading the uh, Christian Standard Version. So again, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. Who has believed... What we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man or by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who, considered, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death, because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, 
My righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore I will give the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. With those thoughts, let's bow forward a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we read that prophecy that was prophesied many, many years ago, and now roughly 2,000 years ago that prophecy was fulfilled, and yet here we are today, as we prayed in the office this morning, we're here to celebrate that death. In our members, it's hard to comprehend how we would celebrate that. But in our spirit, we can do nothing else but celebrate that, that you were willing to step down. You were with the Father, and you were willing to, to be born fully human, yet fully God. And that you willingly went to the cross, and then you bore our iniquities. Even your... Your person wasn't desirable, as it states in the scriptures. So, Father, we are just amazed how you care for us. How you love us and how you would be willing to send your, your only son so that you could have a relationship with us again. That all that shame, all that guilt could be done away with. So, Father, we thank you for this gift. We pray this morning that we receive it, not as something we deserve, but as something that you, that you have freely offer, offered us, and in turn, help us to not look for ways to pay you back. Help us to just receive it and to, to just be thankful and to, to live in that thankfulness every day. And Father, we also just want to lift up the Friesen family. Father, be with Helen. We know that you're in the business of healing. So, Father, we pray for healing. We pray for comfort and for peace for Helen and for Henry and the family. Father, just be with them. We also want to lift up Henry Jansen, the passing of a loved one. Though it may seem like it was a long time ago, I am, I am, I don't know what it's like. But Father, you do. You know better than anyone. So Father, we just implore you to, to be near to Henry and just to let him know and feel you in a way that surpasses all understanding. And help us as a church congregation to be an extension of you, to, to not be afraid to reach out and to, to just continually to lift him up. Father, be with uh, Dave and myself as we venture into a new role, so to speak. Father, convict our hearts to, to be obedient to your calling. And may you find us faithful at the end of our days. Father, we lift up Pastor Corny to you this morning as he comes up here. May you be his focal point today. May you be the words that come out of his mouth. And may you just be our all in all. For without you, we can do nothing, nothing good that is. So Father, we thank you again for your son. We thank you for the cross, and we thank you for salvation. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? A couple of people are doing okay. Everyone else is still asleep. I get it, I get it. Corny, thank you for the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. That's uh, the perfect preface for today's message because my only goal today is again to elevate Christ in our hearts and in our minds as he's already elevated according to the book of Hebrews. I have no other, no other message, no other thing for you today other than to look at the person of Christ, to see what he has done for us, what he has accomplished, what he has been through to get to that point. And so if I were to sum up what has been pressed upon me, it would be that Jesus was made worthy of the cross that we deserved. 
We deserved what Jesus suffered, but we were not worthy to take his place on the cross to be the atonement for sin. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and, and it is on this day that we celebrate the death of your son. And we do this because we are in the new covenant. We know what it accomplished, and we are, you could say, the product of what he has done, what he has finished. We proclaim Christ to be our Lord and our Savior. He is the Messiah. He is your only begotten Son from before the foundation of the, of the world. He is the one who came to us in the form of a servant and lived 33 years on this planet as a man, subjected to temptation and to all of the harshness of this life. And you have perfected him to the point of being the sacrifice that was pleasing and good enough to cover the sin of the world. And so we look to Jesus today, and we want to thank you, Father, for your grace and for your mercy upon all of humanity, that you would extend your hand to everyone who is willing to take it, and that you did it through a person, that you came down and you sat with us, and you looked us in the eye, and you said that you came for us. We thank you that you are personal, that you are intimate, and that you are not afraid to get your hands dirty to get the stuff done. So, Father, I pray today for the hearts who have not received you, that you would open their eyes to see the glorious gift of the suffering servant on the cross, and that we are helpless in saving ourselves, and we can only look up to Jesus and say, I believe, and thank you. That's it. So, Father, I pray that you would, again, continually expand our understanding and give us wisdom as we look into your word, that you would continually open up our eyes to see who you truly are and that we can just submit ourselves to you and just trust you every step that we take. We thank you again for your word. And would you give us insight and wisdom to understand it with our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be spending most of our time just jumping back and forth through some key verses in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews is interesting, and it's actually quite fitting for this, because Hebrews highlights the person of Jesus as superior than anyone who came before him in any system that was established before him. He is just better in every way. He's better. So in light of remembering the death of our Lord... There are four parts that I want to try and cover today, and the first being Jesus, who is God, was reduced to a servant of man. Number two, Jesus learned obedience by what he suffered. Three, Jesus is perfected as the founder of our salvation. And four, Jesus is honored and glorified because of all that he went through. So, number one, Jesus is reduced. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, offers us a glimpse of where we're going today. And it says that after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So that phrase there, having become more superior, how did Jesus become more superior? Wasn't he always God? Hasn't he always been more superior? How did he become more superior? And reading through the, the rest of that chapter, the writer makes a relationship between the father and the son very distinct from whatever relationship God has with the angels or any other being. That there is something very, very special and, un and unique about Jesus, the son of God. We also see that because of his righteousness, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, which is a place of honor. And it appears that Jesus earned that place of honor or regained it as if he had lost it. Now, I believe we're all familiar with John chapter 1, where we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and that he became flesh and dwelt among us. I think we're very familiar with those verses. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, it says that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but 
emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And then back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it says that for a time, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. So we see this reduction, that he is brought low. Jesus became flesh. He emptied himself and became a servant and was made lower than the angels. All of these verses imply that he had a higher state before he was reduced. He was somewhere, he was somebody, but he was reduced. And there are a lot of other verses that you'll find in the Old Testament and the New Testament that verify Jesus was with God and was God before time began. I think that's very, very evident and very clear. And during his ministry, Jesus kept saying that he was sent from the Father. And those who saw Jesus had seen the Father. Jesus, God in the flesh, confirms what is written about him hundreds of years before he was born of Mary, and that he, in fact, is the only begotten Son of God. That's just who he is. In being reduced, Jesus identifies with you and me as human and to the conditions that we face in this life. All the hardships, all the difficulties, he knows them personally. Knowing that he was God before creation, we understand that Jesus was already perfect in holiness. He was already perfectly righteous. And because he was not born of an earthly father, but conceived of the Holy Spirit, he was not born with the condition of sin like the rest of us. He was born spotless, but a child nonetheless. And so Jesus, who is God, is reduced to a child born without sin into a hostile world. You're looking at Adam and Eve who were without sin in the beginning, and they were placed into paradise, and they fell into sin. And Jesus was reduced to a place where temptation would await him, and Satan would seek to corrupt him and change the course of his mission. Number two, Jesus learned obedience by what he suffered. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient. Now, there's another part of that verse that we'll get to in the, in the third point. But it says that, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. And back to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, whatever privileges or special privileges that Jesus had as a son of God, He was shown no favors over anyone else, right? Although he was a son, he is the son of God, right? How dare anyone disrespect him? But even though he was a son, he still learned how to be obedient. Just like we're given opportunity to learn how to be obedient. He learned obedience through what he suffered. Even though Jesus was the father's only begotten son, the one in whom he was well pleased, Jesus still had to learn obedience through what he suffered. Learning obedience meant suffering every day of his life by saying no to the flesh and submitting to the Father in every single thing. Everything. I have a couple of really weak examples, but one could be um, if Mary would have said to him as a child, don't cross the road. What's our inclination? I want to cross the road. What's on the other side? I know Lucas, my youngest, did it all the time. Don't cross the road. First thing he does, goes for the road. Don't touch the stove. Well, why not? I want to touch the stove now. We have this curiosity that gets the best of us. If Mary would have said, don't cross the road, Jesus is like, okay, I won't cross the road. If Joseph would have said, come and help me in the shop. We got to finish sanding all these chairs. I don't want to do that. He probably would have went and just sanded all the chairs. He was obedient. In Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 53, we read the story of Jesus at age 12, where Mary and Joseph supposedly lost him for three days, but they find him in a temple, and he's about his heavenly father's business. After their altercation with him, we read in verse 51 that Jesus went home with his parents, and he was submissive to them. You see, I think Jesus was ready for ministry at age 12. 
He was debating with the teachers. He was asking them questions. He was learning from them. He was teaching them. I think he was ready. But he went home and he was submissive to his parents. And then in verse 52, we read that Jesus increased in wisdom. You see, again, there's that increasing of wisdom as if he didn't have it. But he increased in wisdom and in stature as a man, as someone growing up in the flesh, and in favor with God and man. So you see, Jesus is literally growing up like we do. He's growing up and learning and gaining as he goes. After his baptism, Jesus was led into the desert where he fasted for 40 days. That's incredibly dangerous. I think he was on the brink of death. 40 days. Now, he did not fast as maybe some of us would in the comfort of our own home, right? We still have our couch. Go take a nap because I'm fasting and we just take a nap. He was in the desert by himself. There's no comfort there, none. And he's fasting for 40 days. And it is in this condition that the devil comes to him to tempt him with food. It's the first temptation. He says, if you are the son of God, right? Test yourself. If you're the son of God, then command these stones to become a loaf of bread. What would you do with that power? If that was you in the desert, after three days, turn that stone into bread. Yes, I can do that. I'm going to do that. I'm hungry, right? We would give into our fleshly need and abuse our power to do that because we have sin. But Jesus did not. He relied on his father. And he quoted his father's words to Satan to rebuke the temptation. He says, I will not give in to this very tempting thing. And he was tempted two more times in the desert, but he did not yield to the devil. You see, temptation is always hard. It doesn't matter if, you know, what tempts you doesn't really tempt me, but if it tempts you, it's hard. That's the nature of temptation. It is difficult. If it's not difficult, then I would say it's not temptation. Same with suffering. Suffering is always hard. Because if it's not suffering, or if it's not hard, it can't be suffering. Suffering by its very nature is difficult to endure. That's the nature of suffering. We see that in every way, Jesus was reduced to that of a child. He grew up like the rest of us, going through all of the growing stages of life. And he increased in wisdom as he learned from the teachings of the Old Testament. And through it all, he learned obedience through the suffering of saying no to his flesh every step of the way. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. You see that contrast again. We are weak. We would have given in like that. And we do. We do. We give in. And so we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. But we have a high priest, one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Jesus gets us. When we approach the throne of God with confidence because he above all gets us, he knows exactly how we cave and why. He knows where we are weak. He understands it. He knows how hard it is. Part of his perfecting was to go through what we face so that he can sympathize with us, understanding where we're coming from and what we're going through. When we go to him in our time of need, he gives mercy and grace, fully understanding where we come from. That's why he's able to give mercy and grace, because he gets it. He knows why we need it. He knows how much to give. It is with this full perspective and experience that Jesus, our high priest, mediates between us and the Father, sympathizing with our weakness because he understands it. He was tempted in every way that we are, we are tempted, but he never gave into it. He maintained complete dependence on the Father, and he did not satisfy the lust of his flesh, not for a moment. How difficult must that have been? Temptation is always difficult. It's easier to give in than to resist. To resist is the battle. 
Even though Jesus did not sin, I believe his life was much more difficult than ours will ever be. Even before the cross. Because he never satisfied the flesh. Not as a child, not as a boy, not as a teenager. Not as a man. He never satisfied the flesh. He was always dependent upon the Father for everything. He learned from what he experienced as one of us, but prevailed every step of the way. Praise God for the Son of God who won every step of the way. Number three, Jesus was perfected. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, and here is that verse again, but it's the full verse. And being found in human form, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's where his obedience led him, because that's why he came, even to death, the death on the cross. And back to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, it says, and being made perfect. Again, being made perfect. Wasn't he already perfect? But being made perfect, he became the source of our eternal salvation to all who obey him. And I'm reminded of Paul when he talks about the gospel, that the gospel, in fact, is a command that requires obedience. If you believe the gospel, you've actually obeyed the gospel. Eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus' whole 33 years on earth was the process of becoming perfect, but there must be that final stage or that hurdle to overcome. That the one thing that says, now it's perfect. Now it's finished. Right? And for Jesus, that finality was the cross on which he said those famous words, it is finished. The finality, it is now perfect. Perfect. His entire life leading up to this moment made him worthy to endure what had to be done in order for the world to be saved through him. Had he faltered even once, he would have been disqualified for the cross just like we are. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the closest that Jesus ever comes to acting independently of the Father. Just before Judas comes to betray him, Jesus is praying to his father, if there is another way to do this, if there's another way, then then doing this. He had the thought. He said it out loud. He agonized over it. He's sweating drops of blood. He's agonizing over this. He takes it to his father three times. If there's another way. But each time, Jesus submits himself to the father. Why was he able to do that? Because he had been doing that his whole life up to this point. He had always been submitting to his father. And in this moment where I think it was the most difficult, he was able to do it because he had been up to this point. His whole 33 years, submit to the Father, submit to the Father. And now at this moment where he's like, is there another way than this? And he submits to the Father. And it seems backwards to think that only something perfect could be worthy to suffer that, to suffer so greatly for those who do not deserve that kind of love, us, You would think that someone who lived a perfect life like that would, wouldn't have to face suffering. You get a free ticket into heaven. You get a free pass. But in order for sin to be dealt with once and for all, the only thing that would be acceptable is perfection. That's the only thing that'll pass. And this was the Father's will for his Son. Because he knew he could do it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 21 says that we were ransomed by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And in Exodus chapter 12, God instructs Moses and Aaron to take a male lamb without defect, right? A perfect specimen without defect and put its blood on their doorposts as a sign of where they are so that when God sees the blood, he will pass over and not destroy them. 
You see, that, that purity is maintained until the very end. And that sacrifice is acceptable. It is perfect. So why do I say that Jesus was worthy of the cross that we deserve? It was the moment of his crucifixion that sealed his resurrection because he maintained complete dependence on the Father until the bitter end, and at no point did he ever submit to his own will. He maintained the spotlessness of a sacrificial lamb even after facing every temptation known to man. He faced agony in the garden, and as he considered the weight of what he would endure on the cross, he did not turn away. He walked towards it, and he allowed it to happen. And as the Roman guards drove the metal spikes through his flesh, he did not curse them. Instead, he prayed for them, that they would be forgiven, for they do not know what they're doing. He maintained his innocence till his dying breath. Worthy is the Lamb. No one in all of history could have taken that place. None of us could have taken that place. That place was reserved for only a perfect specimen, and Jesus is the only one who qualifies. Because of our sin, we deserve death, the death that he died, but because of our sin, we're also disqualified to be the sacrifice that atones for our sin. We disqualify. We're not, we are, we are tainted. We're stained without him. According to the perfect life he lived, that Jesus did not deserve to die a criminal's death on the cross, but it was because of his purity that only he was worthy to be the sacrifice for our atonement. Only he qualified to take the place on the altar. Jesus wasn't worthy of the cross because he was God and already perfect. Jesus is worthy because he was God and reduced himself to serve us in our filth, the stuff that we've made, and then he took that stuff with him to the cross and nailed it there. He gave up everything and became nothing only to earn his place on the altar in perfect condition for the likes of us. That is why Jesus is worthy of the cross. Because no one has accomplished what he has accomplished. And lastly, Jesus is honored. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. See, there's, there's that pinnacle again, that climax, that suffering of death. In this last line, So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. By the grace of God, Jesus would taste death for us. That is an act of God's grace that Jesus would suffer for us. When we think about the grace that's given to us, I think we, we, we accept that as an act of, or we, we are relieved when we receive grace. We receive grace and we are relieved like, thank you God for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness, right? It's a free gift. I know I can't do it, so we receive his grace, and it's relieving for us. But by the grace of God, Jesus would suffer on that for us. That that's an act of grace. I'm not sure if we've ever looked at it that way before. I, I haven't. Good Friday is all about praising God because it was by his grace that Jesus died for us. It was by his grace that Jesus was made perfect through what he suffered. Jesus was made worthy of every whiplash that tore open his back. He was made worthy of every thorn that pierced his brow and every nail that punctured his flesh. He was made worthy of every agonizing breath he took as he suffocated to death on the cross. And as he experiences the weight of separation from God. I don't believe he was separated, but he felt it.
Jesus, with his body, physically put himself into our spiritual brokenness. He physically, in his body, demonstrated the wages of sin. He physically, in his body, with every nerve and sense he had, manifested what most of us think is just spiritual. You know that the spiritual realm is more real than our physical realm? The stuff that's happening that we can't see is more real than what we are seeing in front of us today. That's where the real battle is is fought. Jesus showed us the spiritual realm in a physical way that we could see it. Jesus showed us on the outside what our wounds look like on the inside. And on the inside, Jesus is pure and spotless, while on the outside, he is torn to shreds. And why do we try so hard to make ourselves look pure and spotless on the outside while covering up our torn up insides? You see, Jesus flips our lives inside out. He shows us the devastation of our sin being torn for us. Do you know how ugly your sin is? How ugly your pain is? How ugly your best efforts of being good enough are? Look at the torn body of Christ. And do you see the righteousness and the connection that he maintained with his Father while being broken for us? That is what he has filled us with. Praise God, for worthy is the Lamb. Are you still trying to earn your way into heaven? Are you still trying to be good enough to make God happy? If you are, Jesus died for nothing. He lived this earth for nothing. It was an act of God's grace that Jesus died the way he did. He died as sin. He became sin who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Jesus was made worthy of the cross by all that he suffered, endured, and prevailed. He never once made a mistake. How many mistakes, how many times have you sinned? How many times have I sinned? You see, we are already too late to offer a sacrifice good enough to make up for the stuff that we did. We're already too late. You see, God, the Father, has accepted the sacrifice of his Son because his Son was perfect, and he proved himself perfect and worthy to sacrifice himself for us. So stop trying to fix yourself. Stop trying to do better. Can you do better than what Jesus did? No. I think we can all agree we cannot. We cannot do better than what Jesus did. So stop trying and start trusting in the finished work of the cross. That's all we have. We do not have what it takes. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. We do not have what it takes, but because Jesus was made worthy of the cross, because he was made worthy to suffer that, through him, we are made worthy to enter into the presence of God. Worthy is the Lamb. We are now allowed to enter into the perfect and holy presence of God because of Christ. With that, how do you guys feel with standing for prayer? Is that appropriate? Father, we often, so often, we're used to kneeling before you, and it's it's a sign of our, our reverent hearts before you. But we're allowed to stand of your great love for us. We're allowed to claim righteousness 
because of what you suffered. And it's humiliating to stand and to proclaim worthy is the Lamb who suffered for my sake. But we praise you, Father, on this good Friday morning for your perfect work, not just on the cross, but every day leading up to it. We thank you for your great love. And I pray that you transform us by your love because we can't fix ourselves. We can't do better. We can never match what you've done. And so, Father, we stand in your presence because we're allowed to by the perfect blood of Christ. We're allowed to stand in your presence. And we say thank you. Thank you for your son, for all that he endured. We may not be able to comprehend everything, but Father, by faith we believe. By faith we submit. And by faith, we, Father, we ask you for understanding. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. As the worship team comes up, I'll leave you with a benediction from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought up again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, which is Jesus living in and through us, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>